if you are involved right now in the process of helping somebody buy or sell a business during the COVID-19, it is imperative that you listen to what our speakers today are going to be talking about. This is going to affect you personally as a, uh, uh, as a business broker. It's going to affect your buyers. It's going to affect your sellers, landlords, franchisors, bankers, everybody that's involved in the transaction, it's going to affect. So, and you need to know as a business broker how it's going to affect everybody. And like I said, it's going to affect you personally. So I'm going to tell you, brace yourself because you are going to hear a ton of vital legal information that you need to know. But before we begin, I, I do want to say this. I am extremely excited and I'm, and I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm humbled because every week we get more and more people that are attending our webinars. Um, we had 325 people pre-register for our, our webinar today. Um, I see we've only got 157 people online right now, but I think we're going to have a lot of views when this goes on the YouTube and um, it's just exciting. We had, not only did we have over 325 business intermediaries uh, pre-registered, but we had a hundred of those business brokers from out of state, from outside the state of Florida. So, you know, it's just great that the word's getting out there about these webinars and this vital information that business brokers are learning. But the thing is, I think is even more important is that there are business brokers out there right now that are shutting down. They're saying deals can't happen and, and, and they're just sitting on the sidelines. But all of us that are attending these webinars, we know deals can get done. We know money can be made. And not only that, deals are getting done and money is being made. And we're optimistic and we're hopeful. And that's really great that we're all optimistic. And I'm going to steal something that I heard the other day because I thought it was really cool. There's one thing that's more powerful or more contagious than the COVID-19, and that is hope. And I think everybody on this webinar right now, it has hope and we're optimistic. And I think what we need to do, not just in the business brokerage and the buying and the selling of businesses, but we need to expose our loved ones, our neighbors, our family, our friends, our coworkers, we need to expose everybody we can with hope and optimism because this is it. I mean, you know, we're, we're facing adverse times right now and adversity determines your legacy. And we need people like you and all of us to be the ones to spread that. Now, I'm not saying we do that necessarily in person. We can do that virtually through Facebook, telephone calls, you know, emails, things like that. But we should be, we should be spreading that positive, positive message to everybody. And so without going on any further, um, you know, nothing is uh, more hopeful than talking about legal matters. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and let's begin our, our, our webinar today. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited because not only do we have three fantastic attorneys with us today, but we have three fantastic attorneys that are also wonderful, great people. And, and I feel really honored to have them here today um, talking with us and giving us their expertise. So I want to introduce them. First person I want to introduce is Deborah Carmen with, with the uh, Carmen Law Firm. Deborah, can you say hi? Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hi, Deborah. Deborah is so an attorney. here, Jim. Thank you. Deborah is an attorney in South Florida, and uh, she's been practicing uh, law for 37 years. She's done over 10. She's been involved in over 10,000 transactions, which just blows my mind away. That's incredible. And uh, you know, she can. Her, her assistant Sylvia. If you don't know her assistant Sylvia, wonderful, wonderful person, right hand person. She's vital, vital to Deborah, right? So yeah, she is. Yeah, she, she is. is. She can be a she can be a remote notary. So right now they can do closings remotely, and I don't think you can get any better than that right now. And that, I think that's great. And one last thing about Deborah is that she's an affiliate member of the BBF, and Deborah has given so much to our organization that I don't think a lot of members realize how much advice and how much work she does for the BBF for free. 
And I'm Thank just really you, glad you were part of the, the, the BBF, Deborah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, great, great. And I want to introduce Mitch, Mitch Fogel with the Fogel Law Group. Mitch, can you say hi? Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Thanks for including me. Great, Mitch. Hey, Mitch, uh, Mitch, he has, um, I guess, offices all over the place, right? You got offices um, in Boca Raton, Orlando, Coral Gables, Jacksonville, yes. all over the place. And, and what Mitch has been doing is he specializes right now mainly in uh, working with lenders, doing SBA loans, um, whether it's the 7A or the 504, um, and he works with the lenders. So when, you know, for instance, when you work with a, a SBA lender, Mitch is on the other side working with the banks themselves, trying to get the deals done. He has a national reputation and he's nationally recognized for the work he's done in the legal profession and in the, in, the, in the area that he practices. So I'm, I'm really glad to have you here today, Mitch. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And, not, and, and last but not least, we have Gil Sanchez. Gil, can you say hi? Hello, everybody. Hey, Jim. Hey, Gil. Uh, Gil is, a, is the CEO and the civil trial attorney for Black Rock Trial uh, Lawyers. And um, he also is a business intermediary. He's a BBF member um, in the West, on the West Coast of Florida. And um, so I think that what Gil really brings to the table here today is that he's got a view of not just the attorneys out there, but the view of us as business intermediaries and what we face every day. And I think it's very, very valuable that we have you on this panel today, Gil. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're very, very well respected, not only in your district, but around the state, both in law, law and in, uh, uh, in business brokerage. So thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Okay. So before, before we begin, I want to start, before I start asking questions, I want to let all the attendees know that uh, there is a chat box on your bottom screen where it says chat. You can click on that. You can write some comments or some questions if you want. Um, and, and I'll read those questions out at an appropriate time. Um, or you can do a virtual wave and raise your hand. And if you do that, I can, I can unmute you and you can ask the questions to the attorneys uh, directly. And what I'd love to have, since we have nearly 100 uh, business brokers online right now that are outside the state of Florida, I'd love to get for you to get on the chat and just say what, what, uh, what, where you practice, what city and what state you practice in. So, Gil, let's go ahead and begin. I want to I begin by asking you a question. Um, you know, in light of the governor's stay-at-home orders, Literally thousands and thousands of businesses have had closed across the state of Florida. And do, do business owners have a claim for business interruption insurance or loss of coverage? Great. So I'm going to give you the, the attorney answer, which is it depends. Uh, but I'm going to get into details uh, in that. One thing I did want to mention, uh, Jim, was something that you mentioned about uh, hope and also about getting deals done. I find that both in my role as an attorney and being a business intermediary as well and engaging with a lot of business owners on both sides, one of the best things in order to get, um, to get that, um, that comfort or that trust in getting deals done and getting sellers and buyers together is the fact that you as a broker have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. And these webinars I think have been so successful because of that. And so those who are, are continuing to attend gather these nuggets of, of information that ultimately is gonna really help them get to the finish line and close those deals. Um, and so today is a big part of that, the legal side of it. Uh, it can be very dry and boring. Hopefully it won't be that way today. I don't think it will, but the information that you're going to learn from all of us, all the attendees is just going to uh, give them that much more knowledge. I always, I always find that when I'm in a business <clears throat> intermediary capacity, uh, a lot of legal questions are asked from business owners, sellers, and buyers. And obviously you have to be very careful and not giving any type of legal advice, but understanding the issues, the legal issues that are out there and being able to um, <clears throat> at least provide a comment, not legal advice, um, very much helps. Business intermediaries understand that, you know, the sellers and buyers can, can feel confident with their, with their representation. And, and, and so segueing into the business interruption and business loss, um, that is a very important topic that's now starting to come up. Um, there's litigation now happening all over the country um, regarding these cases. 
And so I want to first start by saying, uh, really explaining what is business interruption slash business loss insurance. Those terms are used interchangeably. So that's the first thing I want everybody to understand. If somebody says business loss or they say business interruption insurance, it basically means the same thing. It just depends on the policy on, on what words or what verbiage they're utilizing. So uh, let's not get confused by either of those two things. They're basically the same difference. Um, and business interruption insurance or business loss insurance, that comes into play um, through an insurance coverage. And not all, for example, general liability insurances, which as you know, uh, if you're renting a location or you're leasing a location, your landlord's gonna require you to have a commercial liability insurance, or you, or you can also find this type of coverage under a business owner's policy. So under any of those two policies, you need to look to see if it's there. Now, very important, it does not automatically come with the policy. You have to opt into it. You have to get that additional coverage and pay additional monies for it. So for all of the business intermediaries that are out there, when you're talking to, um, especially when you have listings that, for example, uh, they've had to uh, stop uh, doing business because of the stay at home orders or because they're considered non-essential. Now the revenues are not going through. Uh, one of the things that's important to know when you're having these conversations with, uh, with your listings, with the sellers is, listen, do you have a commercial liability insurance? Do you have business, uh, a business owner's policy? Um, they may not know that that coverage is there. So it is important to be able to mention that because that will be monies that potentially they could receive if the claim is, is, is approved. And that's very difficult and I'll get into that. But if those monies and those claims do get approved, then that can help the business obviously continue to survive during shutdown and giving them a, another opportunity to open up down the line. And as a business intermediary, you're not losing that listing anymore. So that's why it's very important for you to be able to ask that question um, or all the listings that you have. Tell the, ask the owner, do you have this coverage? Have you looked at it? So we, now that we uh, know that not all- if commercial I can real quick, Gil, I think that's, that's just incredible because I think a lot of us business brokers didn't even realize, didn't even think about the fact that, you know, these businesses might have, you know, business loss insurance and, you know, we wouldn't even have thought to ask a, a business owner if they had that. And, you know, again, we're, we're, we can be helping out business owners just by being knowledgeable. I mean, that's what we sell all day long is our ability to, or to the knowledge that we have. And right now, in the, in the area the era that we're in right now, with COVID-19, it's imperative that we keep up with all this stuff. So I think that's a great point. I, I'm sorry yes. I interrupted you. Yeah. But no, no, that's, that's a vital that's question we should be asking business owners. And we're talking about non-essential businesses all over here now. So that's very pertinent, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, what, and, and here's like a, a very big, a very important thing is that in these, if you have this coverage, the operative words is whether there's been direct physical loss or damage to the property. And that's where the fight is now taking place and where these insurance companies are starting to deny these claims because they're saying that whether the virus is excluded or not in the policies, they're saying, well, there's no actual physical damage to your, to your location, so we're not gonna provide coverage. Um, right. let, let me give you like a black and white uh, example. Let's say for example, that, um, that you have a restaurant and the fire breaks out and it goes down you know, and you can't operate anymore. And so there's that, or, that, or that time frame of the restoration period or a hurricane comes into play, exactly. And so these, these would be, you know, scenarios where you can actually see the damage on the physical location. And so the probability of getting coverage is a lot higher um, than, if, than if you don't. And right now the virus is a sil it's the silent enemy, right? So you're not actually seeing it. But I'm all, what, one of the things that we're arguing, that, and we're already filing lawsuits, whether in state or in federal court, very important for your business owners who have these policies and, and uh, they don't understand how to read that. And believe me, not a lot of people know how to read those things. They're very, they're very you know, uh, confusing. And boring, um, very boring. And boring, <laughs> very boring. They're like 80 pages, 100 pages, <laughs> you know. Maybe not boring for Mitch because he sees tons of paperwork all the time in those loan documents. No, they're, they're boring. <laughs> they're, okay, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I feel better. Um, but uh, dust them off and have an attorney look at it. Um, obviously I'm providing that service at my firm, but there are attorneys all over the state of Florida and all over the country who are um, reviewing these policies for free. 
if they're going to hire an attorney, it's on a contingency. So you don't actually have to pay the attorney to take on that claim. I mean, imagine adding insult to injury and having to pay a lawyer hourly to file a claim on something you don't know if it's going to get paid. Um, but these are all contingencies. So that's another good piece of information for the brokers to know that when they're talking to, the, uh, to, their, uh, to their clients, to the sellers, um, and asking them and, or telling them, listen, have it, get your policy, have it reviewed by an attorney. They're not going to charge you for anything. They're going to tell you whether or not you have a chance at, at, at filing a claim. So very important. Um, and then, then the attorney's know, another, getting compensated. The attorney's getting compensated if, if the claim goes through, right? If they win. Exactly. Basically. Yep. So you get compensated on the back end, um, like the cheesy personal injury, you know, uh, uh, TV ads always say, you know, we get, we get paid only if you get paid. Um, so that's the same scenario under these type of uh, first party claims. Um, what, what's the, your opinion, Gil, when you talk about a restaurant and you're talking about the fact that they do have now pickups and curbside uh, that you can take out? Is that going to make a huge difference that they're not totally closed? Um, it does not. Um, even if you're just partially operating or there's a partial suspension of your business, um, as long as you can show that there is a loss of, of, of income um, and then the policies actually contain the formula that tells you how to calculate that. You know, usually it's your, your net profit pre-tax. So basically, you know, what you're going to find in your P and L. Um, and then you add to that the uh, uh, overhead salaries and things like that. And that's how they kind of calculate that. Um, but even if it's partial, um, yes, you can still, you can still, you still be able to make a claim. Now, yeah. I would imagine, you know, knowing insurance companies and, and they're going to, they're going to probably immediately deny them right off the bat. Um, so what happens when these business owners get denied I and mean, what, what goes from there? What's the process from there? Yeah, that's a great point. So, uh, first thing, once you review the policy and if there is business, uh, interruption or business loss insurance, my recommendation is, uh, definitely file the claim because in order for you to put the, for you to have a shot at suing your insurance company, if they don't want to pay is that you have to file the claim first before you file suit. So file the claim it doesn't cost you anything. Just look at your policy. There's always a phone number there. Or call your agent who sold you that. Tell them, hey, I want to file the, 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 uh, the, the claim. Right now, those claims are getting denied very quickly. I mean, I'm seeing them denied like one day to the next, uh, three to five days. I mean, it's happening all over the place uh, in the United States that are, that are being denied. Once you get that denial, okay, the next step is, I think at that point, you definitely gonna to wanna to talk to an attorney to review yeah. the policy if you hadn't done that already. Um, and then at that point, we could give you a final analysis as to yes, this is worth uh, filing a lawsuit over and then just handing the claim over to the attorney. The attorney at that point will then, you know, file the lawsuit and then go through the litigation process. We are right now, you know, like on the 10th yard line um, of these claims. You know, we still have 90 to go. We're just starting um, in that. And, you know, the, the, on the flip side, it's unfortunate because the insurance companies, because they're seeing that their own investments that make money, you know, starting to go down because of the market and having right. to pay other claims that are out there, you know, even though they're sitting on a surplus, uh, if they open up the floodgates and start uh, approving these claims without forcing attorneys to go to, to court, you know, so the insurance lobby is already going crazy about it. Uh, I, I, you know, I can understand why. Hey, is this kind of deal like the, uh, what happened with the hurricanes over in New Orleans where they didn't have flood insurance and there was all these lawsuits in New Orleans, yes. New York? That's similar to what we're talking about. Absolutely. That's a, great, that's a great observation. That's exactly what's happening now. Uh, there are different states around the country uh, whose legislatures are starting to get together and trying to pass bills that basically says something like, hey, insurance companies, pay the claims, yeah. we'll help you, reimburse you, we'll work something out on the back end, right? So that's one way of doing it. Um, I think that's going to be the faster way of being able mm -hmm. to get money into business owners' claims because, I mean, I feel horrible when I have to tell a client, listen, I, I, I'm going to file suit, but I don't know how long this is going to take. I mean, if you're in federal court, you're not going to get a trial date for about two years. Right. A business owner doesn't even care what's going to happen, you know, even six or eight months from now. I mean, these things you need to get resolved immediately. And that is now, you know, this, Yo, this, let's is, talk the about this is the thing, oh, too. This is the thing, too, is I, I want to make this point as well in this whole scenario, because anytime people are talking about suing insurance companies or suing, 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 
you got to remember these business owners, they paid a policy for how many months or how many years to protect themselves against things like earthquakes, hurricanes. Nobody ever probably thought about a pandemic, pandemic, but right. you know, that they paid for this. Mm -hmm. So they deserve, mm -hmm. they deserve the money. It's not something that they're just winning the lottery. And I think that's the point. That is a, 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 that's such an important comment and observation that the president of the United States a couple of weeks ago in one of his daily briefings even mentioned that. He said, you know, every, if I'm paying all of these mo this money for every single month, these premiums, and now that I need it the most, you're going to deny it on a technicality? You know, I mean, th that doesn't seem equitable. And so the reason why it's important to, to be in a lawsuit is because um, now you're going in front of a judge, right? And the judge can start making decisions as to what they believe how, or how, these, uh, how the language should be interpreted. They're called declaratory judgments. We're asking the judge to declare what the meaning of the contract is, or the contract being the insurance policy, yeah. it's a contract. And then from there, hopefully, we'll get a shot at, at getting a claim paid Gil, out. Gil, I, I can't tell you how, um, how important what you just said is. I mean, us, you know, me as a business broker, I walk into a business owner, you know, they're struggling financially. You know, not only am I talking to them about, the, you know, the PPP, which mm -hmm. is pretty much over at this point, but yeah. now I can say, hey, do you, have, do you have, you know, business loss insurance? And if they do, I can say, hey, you can, you can go out and you can, you can try to file a suit for that. It doesn't cost you anything. It makes, makes me look, you know, very valuable in their eyes right away. And I, I, you're, what you're sharing is just incredible, Gil. I really, really appreciate it. And, and you know, I'm telling you, Gil, I think if you look towards the future, I think they're going to be offering this type of coverage at a premium. Yes, absolutely. Um, a couple of, uh, I mean, I'm reviewing a lot of policies daily, and the, I'm seeing new policies that are coming out, which initially what they're doing is they're including uh, the virus exclusion, which basically means that if, if your business is affected because of a virus, then they're not going to pay the claim. Um, right. All of the, right. before all of this COVID-19 was happening, the vast majority of the policies that I'm seeing did not have a virus exclusion. They'll have a bacteria exclusion. They'll have a fungi exclusion and things like that. But I think at the, I think long term, uh, yes, I think that's gonna, we're gonna start seeing insurance companies starting offering that and being more clear as to how that's gonna be paid out at a premium. At a premium, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Gil? So, yeah. Uh, Gil, I think that's, that's fantastic information and I, I really appreciate um, you sharing that with us today. Um, because of time, I think we need yes. to pivot to our, to our next topic and, and maybe at the end here, we can get some questions answered by the, um, uh, after we get through all three topics, so we can get some answers, questions, questions answered, excuse me, from our attendees. So Mitch, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, sure. I know Mitch, you're, you, you work with the lenders themselves, um, handling the, the, the legal paperwork or the paperwork to get the loan done on uh, 7A loans. Mm -hmm. And you know, we all hear um, about the situation right now where the federal government is going to pay six months of uh, principal and interest on those loans, um, but you know they've what they've done is they've tied in this last package they've tied the PPP money to the seven A loan monies that are in that bucket. So you know maybe you can address that for us and, and kind of give us an update of where that's at because I really don't want to wait until July first. Right. So. I think it's every day seems to be just another day, Groundhog Day, right? Like you can't tell it's Thursday. So I don't know if they did this Monday or they did it last Friday, but essentially what they did by passing this additional money and uh, for the additional PPP money was that they coupled the um, new PPP money with the existing balance of funds that are existing um, within the traditional 7A uh, program. And the problem with that is that when this money is spent or allocated during the course of the, this week, which they will probably do in the next day or so, yeah. you will not have any 7A money available for any loans that don't already have a, a um, SBA loan number yeah. until July 1st at the earliest. Um, being that tomorrow is May 1st, that's two months of potentially any new deals that would come through, not being able to get um, a number, an SBA number, and therefore not having funds allocated 
so that they, and, and all of what that means. Like for example, you would, if you had a deal that showed up that maybe got signed two weeks ago and they just haven't been able to go to the bank yet or the bank was tied up in PPP loans and they haven't been able to pay attention to this, like almost every lender in the country, then they circle back to it and they go, oh, look at that. We, we can't get allocation. I know you're supposed to close on May 28th, but can't get financing from me, can't get financing yeah. from the bank down the block or the bank on the other side of the state or the bank in a different state. It's not there. So what does that do to your deals? Well, <laughs> if I was one of your listeners um, or one of your attendees here, um, I would be looking at my, my grouping, my bucket of deals to see if that can be a, a, a circumstance that would take place. And so the first thing I'd be doing is to get to the borrowers. And it's a little late in the game now because I think the funds are going to run out if they don't do something and get to the lender and say, hey, can you pull a number quickly? And without being too complicated, some lenders can do that right away because they're in a special program called the Preferred Lenders Program, a PLP program. Other ones have to go to the SBA to get those numbers, and that is not going to happen. Yeah. Alternatively, you got to go back to the buyer and seller and reset expectations, right? I mean, sorry, we can't close yep. on the 28th with financing. What do you want to do? Um, there's a million solutions that can come out of that. Uh, yep. Seller bridge financing, which can be refinanced through a 7 day program. Uh, delay the closing until, you know, after July 1st, with your fingers crossed that they're going to have the money back. Um, and the reality of it is, is that when the act comes out, they basically give it to the SBA and say, okay, here's our thoughts. This is really what we, what we want, but you can make certain changes in this. I don't know if they can uncouple it. I, um, no, I, I don't they think they the, can. The ability to do that. Yeah. They have to go back and what everybody's hoping to do now is that the, there will be a new, we'll call it um, reconciliation act, if you will, that will make other adjustments, including that uncoupling or allocate additional funds to take place because there, there will be um, no new SBA loan allocations during that period of time that this circumstance is in place. So know, know your deals, right? Know what you got to do. Speak to the people you got to speak to to keep your deals alive the best you can. And of course, the longer something goes out, we all know things can happen during that period of time. So there's risk that goes with that too. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's what's going on right now relative to some hot buttons in there. Um, on a PP, PP home basis, I know you and I talked about that briefly. Um, that's a very interesting concept. And you maybe were going to ask me this down the road, but since I got to like open the Pandora's box, I'll yeah. just continue unless somebody wants me to stop. Um, so you can imagine that now you've got some other component to to build into your deal when you're doing a business acquisition, when there's a PPP loan that exists, because now there's a debt obligation of a, of a company. What mm -hmm. does that mean? If it's, it doesn't matter if it's $55,000 or $555,000. Um, it hasn't been paid because there's a six month deferment, but if a buyer is gonna buy that business, then theoretically that buyer is gonna have to deal with that transaction or that, that uh, loan forgiveness component down the road. There's a lot of moving parts to that in business buys and sells anyway. And this is something that every buyer and every seller has to be thinking about because there's such a volume of these loans that are going out that there's a very strong likelihood that a selling business will have on its books a PPP loan over the next six months. Okay, so, so, have, so that's something that can I, need to be Can I just about. ask you a question, Mitch? Because yeah. everybody's been asking me and I know the answer, but I think everybody should know the answer. They're saying now, what if we do a stock transfer? Can you transfer those? That was the question I was going to ask. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, want, we need to know that. <laughs> we need to know that. All right, right. so, so the, the PPP loan is to the business. So my understanding is that, yeah, if you're buying it on a stock, you can transfer it. Frankly, if you're buying it under an asset, you probably can transfer it just as well. It, it, it just, if you don't, then you got to pay it off, but you'd have to, you have to go back to that lender. It's like any other loan. If you want to assume a loan that's out there, you got to treat it like any other loan. So I'm sure, you know, you know, Gil and Deb and, and all our contemporaries, you know, I still do every once in a while a business buy and sell. And I know I'll be looking for that issue as well. So um, yeah, you need to ask that question. 
Um, the, the challenge you're going to have, think about this for a second. One of the first things that you do when you're a buyer's counsel is you, you do your due diligence. You do your UCC searches and you find a UCC and you mm -hmm. start asking all the important questions. Well, guess what? <laughs> there is no UCC, UCC on a triple P loan. So mm -hmm. you may not be able to know from a buyer doing your due diligence or from a lender making a loan with a triple P loan that one exists. And I'm not aware right now of a clearinghouse mm -hmm. or some other type of, you know, data facility that allows you to find that out. They're going to have to because I, I would put on Deb, Bill, yep. anybody listening, I would put on my checklist yeah. today. Yeah, okay. I would too, and I would put it on get a copy of the note because that's going to tell you everything. Well, yeah, it gets from well, yeah, but can I can I add to a yeah, but? So yeah. the answer is yeah, but because. Um, well, the law required that they use a note of some sort, like a uh, 147 SBA note or, or a modification of it. I am aware of lenders that did these deals with great haste, and um, I won't say and the no best note? of intention, and did not use promissory notes. Are you kidding me? Nope. Wow. Wow. I wish and I had I, that list. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm well aware, and a lot of people in the industry are, too. And it came to my attention in a very indirect way. And the lenders that did this are very large lenders. And, How can and, they get paid back? How can they get paid back in the obligation? Them? Great question. Don't have an answer. Yeah. I don't know how they get paid. Worse, worse. This is such a big blow up. They, they lenders were in such a haste to get this out for good reasons and maybe not so good reasons because you probably would read the paper. Um, and essentially at least one, and I think there's a couple more, did some loans, I don't know if they did all their loans, but they did some loans without a promissory note. Wow. And some of them are not de minimis. Some of them are several hundred thousand, maybe more. Jeez. And I, I, I found out about this um, through a, a strange source, and I did a little homework, and I found out from some other people that, in fact, it is true. So I'm very curious as to how that gets resolved. Well, what does the SBA do to forgive them if they don't have a note and they didn't follow proper procedure? SBA may not forgive those people that receive the loans. You, right, right. So I'm going to, so Gil, okay, <laughs> sucks you right back into the conversation. So I, I, I have done just enough litigation to probably um, get myself in trouble. In You're my like life. I am. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I know this. I do know this. Some of the litigation I've done has been lawsuits on uh, foreclosure lawsuits. So you need promissory yeah. notes. And yes, you can't really yes. Have a, a, there's ways to do a lawsuit without a promissory note, but they're really tough and it's very hard to prove. And a judge is going to say, "Show me the note," especially when yep. it's an SBA loan. Yep. So it's a real challenge to do that. But on, but when you think about it for a second, um, these loans, but for fraud or misuse, are not. There's no personal recourse for them. So the company. Um, to early, your earlier point, you know, Deb, of do you do a stock purchase or it's an asset purchase and, and how does yeah. that matter um, if it doesn't um, have any recourse to the owners of the company? Um, in fact, it stays with the company. If you did an asset purchase, maybe you avoid the liability, maybe you don't. I, I, it's a whole group of litigation that's going to keep a lot of lawyers very busy for a long time. But yeah. I would go back to the bank and I'd say, hey, bank, you were supposed to give me a promissory note on this. I can't get it forgiven. I'm calling Gil Sanchez and he's going to file mm -hmm. a lawsuit against you tomorrow because now I'm stuck with a $300,000 loan that I got to pay back right. for, even if it's 1% interest in 18 months. I can't afford that. Right. You know, one, no, exactly. One, one thing I wanted to, to ask the group, uh, what you guys thought about this to, for uh, business intermediaries and brokers to protect themselves on deals because there's no UCC one filings happening uh, on these PPP loans and, and these contingencies that might, uh, be placed on the asset purchase agreements. Um, do you think that uh, you should have a, a CYA, right? So <clears throat> for example, the broker tells, uh, asks the seller that, listen, buyer is wanting to know if there's a PPP out there. There may or may not be some type of lien asserted on the assets down the line or in the future. We don't know that. But let's say, for example, if, if the purchase does happen, and then down the line, there is going to be some type of assertion that there's a uh, there's a, a a lien on the FF&E, um, and then the new the new buyer owner is now stuck with that. 
And they want to go back to the broker and say, well, you failed to tell me um, because there's all of those unknowns. I wanted to hear it from you guys. Do you think that there should be uh, some additional there, language on the list? There, there should be a, a rep and warranty deal. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but there should be a reps and warranty about uh, whether you've taken this PPP, you know, any loans that you have. And, and, and that, would, that would be, and that would be basically added to the closing, the closing documents, correct? Well, it'd be added, I think it'd be added to the yeah. contract, to the contract okay. itself, which you have language in there. Um, I don't know, Mitch, what you're thinking, but that's what I think should be in there that says, I either took one, I didn't take one, at least you have some representation made by a seller. Yeah, I, 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 I well, for, if I have, a, have the opportunity to work on a transaction prior to it going under contract, that, that's one of the questions that, that I ask all the time and I make sure it's in our contract that the seller makes certain representations right. and warranties. And I know in some of the standard form contracts, they do have obviously reps and warranties. So maybe you add that to it or maybe you know you add in, the, in another section on the bottom or you do an addendum, but at the end of the day, th this is the challenge with the triple P loan is that there's no way to know that it's out there unless the seller tells you it's out there. Um, there may be, some people may have books that reflect it. Look, and you'd like to think that their books and records are accurate and they show that they have that, but they don't always. But, you know, I mean, small businesses have a lot of methods to keep you know, track of what they do. In the meanwhile, you, you, you could buy yourself a real big problem. And if I was a broker, I would put on my checklist, like my, my you know, questions to ask my prospects. Um, they, the very first thing would be, um, almost right after, are you interested in selling? Would be, um, and, and what kind of debt do you have? And does that debt include a triple P loan? And then you can kind of find out. And then you can dig in and find out how much, and who's it with? Oh, it's with um, City National Bank. Yeah. Okay, great. There's ways to find out the information on that. Jim, but so don't, don't, don't don't neglect to do that. Have a disclaimer. Pardon me, Jim. Have maybe a disclaimer that that they they sign even if they say they don't they don't have a PPP. They sign something saying that they don't and include that with the paperwork. Well, you, I mean, I know Deb well, and I've known Deb yeah. a long time, and I know the way we've done a lot of work together, and um, you know, and anybody that's done even a decent amount of deals here is going to have as part of your buy, sell closing documents, uh, you know, affidavits and warranties, representations, indemnifications and stuff like that, that the seller is going to sign. Um, so I would think that for your brokers that have experience and have done this, yeah. this is something that they're either going to refer to an attorney or if there's not going to be an attorney involved, they'll have a, uh, a transactional closing attorney who I hope will include this, I do a lot, a lot of deals with I, guys. I think we have to, and, and, brokers, we have to make sure, you know, I, I know Deborah would include it, but, you know, as business brokers, do, you know, we, we have to make sure that's part of the closing paperwork. We can't just hope and pray that the closing right. is automatically going to include this stuff. We have to have our heads in the game as a business broker. And maybe it's a good time well, to pivot, Deborah, yeah. and talk about other things that maybe us as business brokers need to do to protect our, well, ourselves personally. Yes, no, great, Jim. And, and actually, you know, what Mitch said, or Gil said is 100%, you need to have the right language in the contract. And what you want to be careful of, too, is let's say even people who got sick during COVID-19, you got employee problems, you have sick leave problems, all of these things are going to come out now that we never would have thought of before. So employees are pretty important over here because uh, another way to get forgiven on the PPP is you have to have employees there eight weeks afterwards. Uh, so uh, there, there's so many different contingencies you're going to look at. If you start to sell a business right now um, during a pandemic, there's a lot of things you want to be careful and you want to have, uh, you know, you don't dot your I's and cross your T's. So there's a lot of things you're going to put in disclaimers, a lot of things that you're going to go ahead and, uh, and have them seek legal representation or, you know, at least have them waive that they didn't have legal representation, because now I think it's more important than ever before to have that representation. Well, uh, you know, prior, you know, maybe there's some situations, even a small pizza pile or anything else. But if you have people that got sick from COVID-19, you've got people there that are not there any longer because they died. You know, oh. while, you know, while working there, there's all, you can look at Tyson today, you look at, you know, what's going on over there in the news. There's so many different aspects of a business. And, and one of the things I want to talk about to go off topic for one second is what happens when you're even doing the listing and you're going through there. 
do you have people sign off? You know, do you want someone to come in live and see the business? Do you want them to walk through? Have, and, and you're going to make sure that there's a couple things there because you want to make sure that there is no issue where people were exposed to COVID-19. You have a buyer, for instance, they go in on a listing appointment. There's problems over there. It didn't get rectified. Nothing got cleaned up. There's issues. They get sick. What are you going to do? Uh, now, what happens Deborah, if you have there, a seller there... and the and, and, and I'm sorry, Deborah. Not... So what I'm suggesting is I, I'm suggesting we do actually an addendum, okay, you know, to every listing and we put over there that that the seller is saying, I want to have a buyer be able to come in live and take a look at the business. And I'm gonna tell you I don't have COVID-19, that none of my employees had COVID-19, the place is up, you know, it's sanitary. Um, and, and really then you can have a buyer sign off too, saying, I want to come in live and I want to see this business. And if you don't have that, there's concerns even before you get to a contract. So yeah, what sick, you're saying sick. is, is there, is there a liability? So I guess what you're getting to is that if we have a buyer seller meeting set up and the buyer yes. goes into the buyer seller meeting, takes a tour of the business, ends up getting COVID-19, is there a responsibility on our part? I mean, could they point the fingers at us as business brokers? Well, well, that's what I'm saying. The best thing to do is have a sign off. Okay. So as soon as you're going to go to a listing appointment, the seller says, I want them to come in. I don't have any issues. The buyer says, I'm a prospect. I want to come in over there. I want to see the business live. They sign off. And then you're in a better situation. It's very difficult to prove where anything came from either, yeah. but still it's better to have the protections. And that's why I say too, when you start doing these different changes in languages, you're going to make sure that you're going to have either an addendum. Um, and I would do it as an addendum. I wouldn't put all this necessarily into a contract because remember things change. Now, of course, they say come December or come October, or November, we're going to have another outbreak here. So this doesn't appear to ever go away until there's a vaccination, whatever it is going to be, this is going to be our new norm. You so you want to make sure you, you have some languages. I'm getting out of all this, you know, you're seeing certain industries that are just doing very fantastic during, during this yeah. time. If you're making a Amazon. mask, you're doing great. You're making Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, what, what, the, the owner is another 25, made another $25 billion this year. And then you see- Number Zoom. one. He's great. number one now. Yep. And you know who else I think is doing great right during these times? You attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's an, it's an interesting situation because, um, you know, we're here to help all the brokers. We're here also to, to make sure that the sale you know, will go through as seamlessly as possible. But there, there are issues here. And I don't think anybody really talked about today force majeure. And that's like the, the whole, you know, clause of the decade right now is, is force majeure. Does everybody know what force majeure is? I think you should go ahead and explain it, Deborah. Okay. And, you know, that's, it's basically what we call an extraordinary event. We talk about hurricanes here in the state of Florida. We talk about uh, if there's any kind of infraction, if there's any kind of, uh, of issue over here, we don't have earthquakes. But if you're in California, earthquakes, landslides, all these go under force majeure. And that allows a party to suspend or terminate performance, you know, based on un, uh, basically unanticipated circumstances beyond a party's control. And that's the real issue over here. You can't fulfill your obligations under a contract. It's either impossible or impractical, okay? And you have to have something here then to protect the buyer who's coming into this contract to say, listen, if the lender is taking longer, you have to be protected over here as a buyer. If uh, it's harder to do due diligence, if people don't want to go out and look at books at this point, if people aren't going to leave their homes, how are we going to do this virtually? What are we going to do here? So all this has to be anticipated when you start getting into a deal during a pandemic. And, and one so, thing, Deborah, I, I wanted to just uh, cut in really quick. Um, and Jim, yeah. you should really think about this. Um, we have uh, the, our, 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 our forms, right, our BBF forms. Um, right. that have been vetted by attorneys and brokers and finally comes up with a form that we all utilize. Uh, I think that absolutely this should be high priority and determine what, what forms can be uh, drafted for broker protection for CYA because, right. you know, brokers have E&O insurance and, and contingency attorneys are, you know, we're looking at suing people who have insurance policies. So, but if you have these CYA documents, where the, where the brokers aren't themselves drafting up what they think will protect them, um, I think it would be good for the organization to be able to take a look at that and see what we can then uh, vet 
and then upload into our MLS system. And we can, uh, we can utilize that both from going before going to listings and at least having a, some type of document where it proves that we've, we have, we've asked this information and also from the buyer and the seller standpoint, signing off on documentation, you know, so there, so that there's no issues happening between them too. Uh, I see some comments here um, that also the asset purchase agreement, I know it's called a little bit differently, but the, the asset purchase agreement that we have in the BBF mm -hmm. maybe should, also, should be, incorporate an additional uh, clause, COVID clause, that is going to cover the parties and the brokers as well, because, you know, as it relates to PPP issues, as it relates to uh, infectious, um, yes. that might happen down the line, because I think for the next three to five years, we're going to, we're going to see the ripple effect now. And so that's something that I would definitely would uh, love to be a part of and giving my two cents from a litigation standpoint on drafting some really great language along with Mitch, Deborah, and whoever. You know, I, 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 I got to you know, gotta say, I, I really appreciate you um, offering that. And I might recruit uh, Deborah uh, on, on that as well, if she's okay. And because um, our question and answer uh, chat box is being lit up by BBF members right now. Yeah. And saying we have to get that done. We have to get it done. And, and I totally agree. I mean, we, you know, we have to. Yeah. Get it done. You know, it's interesting, Jim, because we should, have, it, we should have separate language. And I think it really might be done by an addendum now as opposed to just being incorporated into the contract because things will change. Other things come up. And it's not necessarily something that's always going to be in there as a pandemic. Um, but, you know, think about closing dates. Think about over here, unavailability, unavailability of even appraisal to go out there and do a business evaluation. Um, people to sign travel, you know, sign to uh, travel to go to the documents and sign the, uh, at the closing. People right now in some different countries are under a mandatory quarantine, can't get here to sign these documents. So yes, we can do remote notarization, but a lot of times banks and other uh, people are not gonna take the remote notarization and it just all has to be looked at. So it's a way to protect uh, buyers and sellers and, and talk about the delay. And certainly, you know, we can put that uh, addendum together. And I just really wanted to quickly talk too about leases because leases are really gonna be a, an issue, an interesting issue now too. I've seen people are very concerned now about the language in a lease. They, they're looking, do I have to pay the lease? You know, we're closed down over here. What am I going to do here? Because the landlord's still insisting upon payment. So there's a lot of things when you go and you, you take a listing and then you start, you know, wondering if they paid the lease, what's going on over here. And that litigation and that actual UCC you're going to see from most of these landlords uh, is going to prevent you from selling that business unless we make a, a deal with that landlord. And that landlord's gonna have a, a lot of different considerations over here because re remember, they have to pay for certain expenses as well and they don't wanna absorb the loss of having a tenant not pay rent. And most of the times, if you read these leases, they don't mention anything about a pandemic. They might talk about force majeure, but they're not gonna define it over here of anything with a virus, epidemic, anything, period. They're gonna be very specific uh, to acts of God and it's gonna be argued, is that an act of God? Is this, you know, what is going on over here? And I, and I think Gil probably has more litigation now, more prospects over here about leases. But think about people who are entering into a lease now because things are done already when you start taking these listings, but your buyers can start talking about clauses they wanna see. They wanna see if there's gonna be any abatement of rent if there's this period of time where they're not gonna be able to access their business. Um, they want to be you know, sure, assured over here um, that they're going to have that business interruption insurance that Gil was talking about. But also, uh, what if there's a situation where there's a build out? What if the build out's delayed? People can't pull permits many times now during this pandemic. What happens there if there's going to be improvement allowances? You know, everything that's in a lease today or any changes, you know, if they go in there with a franchise or anything else, period, all comes out uh, with what we're talking about. So there's, it's not just one issue is what I'm trying to mention, Jim. There's so many different issues you have to look at. Um, it becomes, you know, such a, it's an issue for a buyer because they're going to walk into what could be an issue for them down the road, one right now. Um, and we all have to know what to do to help them out. And, and then there's sellers too, because seller needs to be able to sell that business. And they might have a lease that right now people are realizing they can work from home. Yeah, and if, uh, while you're on leases, um, so a couple of things that have come up recently. Oh, First SBA all, with leases, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, right, so um, if I'm wearing my Deb Carmen hat as the buyer's 
attorney or seller's attorney for the moment, going way back. A um, couple things about leases. If there's renegotiation, if there's negotiations going on where there's a, a rent that's deferred for a certain period of time, you right. got to make sure that you're looking into that because that's obviously going to become somebody else's obligation. Um, right. Depending on when you close, like so, the benefit of the deferred rent may go to the seller, but then it may kick in while the buyer has it. Um, sometimes uh, there is a uh, option to renew, and there is a time period almost always in when you need to execute documents uh, uh, and exercise an option to renew. And if you lose and that, you're in a world of hurt. Yeah, and, and so, right, now there's obviously the practicality of doing things or practicability of doing things, and you have landlords who don't want to lose a tenant, so it's not like your typical space where some tenant may go out, but then there's like 10 behind him who will jump in. That's probably not going to be, at least for the time being, the dynamic that exists out there. But, you know, to your point, um, there's a lot to consider uh, on the leases. There's stuff to consider in the insurances. Um, we mm -hmm. talked about that at the beginning, uh, getting the insurance, the timing of the insurance. Look, we do a lot of real estate work and, and, and on a lot of deals where um, you might find this hard to believe, buyers and sellers or don't have counsel. And then as the bank's <laughs> attorney, we have to do a lot of the due diligence on a file that we can't get from right. somebody else who knows what they're doing, doing right. the job. Right. Because typically that would be what a buyer or seller's counsel would do. And in today's world where they're short staffed, uh, really kind of back to Debbie's point of, hey, on a construction deal, getting a permit, that's one thing. But even just getting searches done in a lot of cases is taking additional time. Right. And, right. and, um, and you've so got also, also to see if there's violations. You're not going to be able to see if there's violations, there's correct. issues, can't correct. see them. Yeah. yeah, the last thing you want to do, if you're a buyer's counsel, you're everything. If I got a tenant that's going in and taking a 25,000 square foot warehouse and it's a triple net lease and my guy's responsible for everything, I'm treating that almost like it's a, like it's a sale of the real estate because right. I got to make sure my guy goes in there or my gal goes in there that um, there is not a um, hidden you know, lien that needs to be addressed or code violation that needs to be dealt with. The time to do that is during your diligence period and sometimes it's hard to get that information. Um, there was also some comments about the uh, contract. Uh, the BBF contract. And mm -hmm. although I don't know it by heart, and I probably used to know it better by heart, but I don't. And I think there's a provision in there about representation. Is, is there a provision in there about representations of um, existing debt obligations on the business or no? No. Okay. So you can't. No, not, so you can't not that specific. Oh, it's not that specific. Okay. Right. So you, you, you may for the time being, if it's easy enough to change, yeah. I, I would say so that nobody forgets to do it. This is just Mitch Fogel saying, hey, yeah. I, I've seen some of the comments and, and so forth and everybody's on the same page, just makes a lot of sense. But if you can just add a couple of paragraphs or one good paragraph in there that I'm sure Deb can draft and Gil, and if you wanna to speak to me and I'll give you a lender's perspective, I'm happy to do it, that covers what debt do you have and does that include any PPP loans or anything else? Because no, there, there will be no um, UCCs to look that up. Um, you know, uh, have you negotiated anything with the landlord? Is there, you know, All whatever there may be that we mm -hmm. can brainstorm and come up with, what? that'll be useful. Back to, the, back to the term of the lease though for a second. Uh, for those of you that have done deals with the SBA, you know that as a general rule, the term of the lease, including all options to renew, has to equal or exceed the term of the loan. So, um, I know that if you don't deal in this industry very much, you may not remember that or you may not know it, but that's pretty important. So you're not going to get a deal done if you can get SBA financing, if you have a problem with your lease term right. um, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. And, and, and so it's important because we look at that lease too. And if you've got six months of free rent, and it's 25,000 a month now. And then that goes back in in the second year. That's going to change also some of the cash flow right. Uh, right. that the, uh, the, the buyer is going to have and the lender is going to want to know about that. One. So um, those are just some thoughts I have about some topics that uh, were floating out there. I wanted to, to I ask you, Mitch, what yeah. last night, I guess the, uh, I heard that the Small Business Administration uh, um, came out with some more documents or language or updates. Um, and I, I haven't heard what that was. Have, have you had time to review any of that? They, they added, 
they added, there's something you, that anybody on this um, webinar can find. It's called the FAQs for the Triple P program. And if you Google FAQs Triple P, you'll get to it. Open it up on your uh, Chrome or whatever you use, and then every date, just do a refresh, and whatever they do the day before, whatever, it'll pop up. They, they were on 35, this came up with 36. I, I, don't think the third, I don't think the 36 one had anything to do with what we're doing here. Um, but um, they, they, they've, been they've been fine tuning some of this. Now, another thing also to consider is uh, that there are a lot of tax changes, and I'm not a tax attorney by any means, but right. they're significant enough that I would encourage anybody buying a business or selling a business to go to a qualified accountant CPA, you know, and say to them, these portions of the CARES Act that include certain deferrals of payroll tax and other things that create some benefits and some obligations down the road, <clears throat> I need to know about them and how they affect my deal. On a, on a stock transaction, it's going to be a matter clearly a lot. On an asset purchase, it probably will matter some as well, because in a lot of cases, if you, have, if you don't change the business, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's deemed to, by the government to be the same business. So um, you'll, you still have payroll obligations, you still have sales tax obligations, mm -hmm. even if it's a brand new business. So um, I, I think these are things that it's not business as usual and it won't be for a while. And I think these are things that you just need to know about. And, if, and as, as there are um, uh, professionals in all industries, the professionals of the, you know, uh, the business intermediary and business brokerage uh, business will need to keep abreast of this because it's going to keep changing quite a bit. And, and also, if I may make one observational comment on this too, what a lot of people haven't quite dug deep enough to realize is, is that the SBA was, for a brief period of time, married to the Treasury Department. And so um, I'm, I'm not picking the best words out, but let's just say that the decisions relative to how the SBA behaves and acts now are not just those of the SBA they are in many ways affected by decisions by treasury. And that's why you have Mnuchin, you know, making all the rules or a lot of them. And then you have the SBA implementing them. So what I would say to everybody is, and I mean this because I know it's frustrating in many ways. I, I would just ask that you be patient with the lenders. They are going undergoing tremendous stress. If you think, Mm -hmm. that getting these PPP loans out was stressful. The forgiveness part of this, it's going to show up in six to 10 weeks is going to make that look like a walk in the park. These guys are working 24 hours a day. It's going to be, it, it's, it's, it's going to be crazy because the bankers don't know probably half of what they should know about what to do with, um, Mm -hmm. The forgiveness yeah. part of this. Can they unilaterally right. forgive it? Maybe. What if they make a mistake? Who owns that? Who wants to take that risk? When do they get their money from the SBA? What happens if? And you can fill the if in with a lot of different things. So just understand that your bankers are going to be pretty and stressed out um, yeah. about some of this stuff. And, and it may mm -hmm. take longer to get done between now and I don't even know, maybe even next winter or spring than it ever took before March 1st of this year. Mitch, I think that's a good, good point because us business brokers tend to be, be impatient. Um, we're at three o'clock right now. Uh, if you guys don't mind, we've got a whole host of questions from our membership. If it's okay, if you guys are, are good for another 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. No, it's perfect. Gil, no, it's perfect. I, I got a question for you. Uh, uh, the business loss insurance is that was that a, is that that's a standalone insurance or is that you know uh, bundled in with some other kind of insurance? So it's it's additional coverage that you pay for that gets embedded within a general liability insurance or a business owner's policy. So it doesn't come automatically. You have to you have to pay for it additionally when you're um, going to 
renew your insurance or get brand new insurance, you need to make sure that you ask your agent that that's a policy, an additional coverage that you want. If you do not mention it, it does not come automatically. So that's why it's important to look at the policy and see if it's there or not. Okay. Is that additional riders? Is that what it is, Gil? Well, actually, uh, yes, it would be. It would be in like an additional endorsement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I want to quickly mention, uh, a, a tip for business intermediaries, business brokers. Um, something I recommend is on your listings, go to the uh, clerk of court website for that county where, where your listing is located. Put it, type in the information of your, uh, of your listing and figure out if there's some type of uh, eviction happening or something has been filed. Uh, sometimes even though you file the lawsuit doesn't necessarily mean that they've been served yet, even though they may have gotten the notice before, but that's pretty good information to get beforehand and not find out like later on. I don't know, Deborah or Mitch, what you guys recommend on that. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a little reluctant because I think going outside of the scope of what you would normally do as a business broker is a recipe for disaster because what if you miss something? You're not trained to do that. So I would suggest that the attorneys get involved in doing that and making sure that search is done properly. Uh, so not to put more of a burden or more of a, of a scope of risk on, uh, on brokers. Yes, yeah, Gil, Gil's That's lucky good. because he's, he wears both hats. <laughs> so, hey, Mitch, this question's for you. Um, you know, once things ease up with the SBA um, and, and things start happening again, what do you think the banks are going to ask for more in terms of financials or anything, um, especially for leisure type businesses? That's a real tough question. Um, I don't think they quite know yet uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty still. Hospitality businesses and restaurant businesses yeah. have undergone something on a national perspective that is unprecedented. Um, we've been hit by hurricanes in Florida, there's been tornadoes in the Midwest and fires and earthquakes elsewhere. So those they are familiar with and they can kind of wrap their heads around a little bit, but it's a little tougher here now. I have a lot of lenders, clients who, who contacted us and said, every deal that you have with me, that is a restaurant or a, or a hotel or anything that's hospitality, don't do anything more on it. Stop. We are reevaluating those right away. Because in the commitment letters, they actually frequently have a language that says that the, that the bank can terminate the commitment if there's a, an adverse change, sometimes material right. adverse change in the right. industry or in the business. And I can't imagine more of a material adverse change than having the, the local government telling you you can't provide your business or service anymore. You're, you're just done. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I have some clients in the restaurant and hotel business, uh, my non-lender clients that are struggling with this tremendously. Um, one of them actually yeah. um, had, a, had somebody interested in buying their business and now they don't know what to do. So right. Um, right. anyway, so to answer your question, uh, your, your the, the attendees question, um, they don't necessarily know, they can't necessarily obviously go off of projections like they might like to do or history like they might like to do um, because there's no telling when, right? I know in Florida, um, and actually, Deb and I live in the southern part of Florida, so this doesn't even apply to us yet so much. Yeah. But they've allowed like 25% occupancy. Then they're mm -hmm. going to visit that and make 50% occupancy. Down, I mean, Gil, maybe you guys, yeah, I think you're okay, Gil. I think you're, are you in Collier County? Hillsborough. Yeah, Hills, Hillsborough, right? Hillsborough, yeah. right? You're Tampa. by Tampa. Okay, so yeah. you guys, I think, got blessed by the governor with that. We, we down here have not. And yeah. so... Um, how do you, how do you look at that? How do you how do you do underwriting on that, right? How do you run credit on that and try to understand what that restaurant is going to look like? This is a really 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 tough time. Um, I I suspect, and I'm hopeful, that um, when we emerge out of this in some manner, the banks will be willing to make loans again to some industries, including retail, that have been devastated by this that they may not. Otherwise, and if they do, it'll probably be through an SBA 7A loan. Having been through, I've been doing this for 30 something years and working in SBA lending for 25. And I've been through a lot of recessions, obviously 2008 and nine were among the hardest ever. Yes. Um, 
the loans that came out in 2009, 10, 11, and 12 essentially were almost all SBA loans. There were very few bank loans that were made. There was almost no investment loans that were made at the time. There may have been, but not many. Miss. I think you're going to see a, a replication of that again. So um, our brokers out there, uh, get to know the uh, SBA uh, lingo and get to know your SBA BDOs in your community and the, le and the banks that are making these loans because those are going to be your your partners uh, when you come out to do your deals. Well, Mitch, let me think about this too now because you're looking at the first quarter and the first quarter might be good. First quarter of what? The first quarter of this year might be good because you're looking to March 31st. A lot of things didn't happen until after that. So right. how are you looking at that now? Because you know April is really the telling month and of course May and June. Right, well, they, 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 they're obviously gonna get any year-to-date financials and they're just gonna see everything essentially go off a cliff. Now, what's interesting yeah. is there are some, some restaurants that are doing pretty well with takeout. I actually spoke to a guy the other day, he owns several different restaurants and uh, he, he had a close one or two, but I think he has four or five other ones and the other ones that he has. He says he's at about 60 to 70 percent capacity doing takeout. So yeah. he's making money, but he's not lighting it up the way right. he did beforehand. Um, it's going to be very hard to hit those numbers. And the reality is, even if they let you go 25 percent, you know this. I mean, I, mm -hmm. what makes money for, for what makes a lot of money, the, maybe the most from a margin is the bar. But right. if I can't meet Deborah at the bar and, and, you know, Gil and Jim, you know, for a drink after work where we're shoulder to shoulder and then somebody comes up behind me and sticks their hands through and said, you know, I just want to get like a, you know, a beer. Yeah. Yeah. Done. If that's mm -hmm. not happening for any, any time soon. So right. they lose all of that business and a lot of restaurants then can only rely on what they can do with table service and the table service is 25 or 30 or 40 percent of what it was even if that lasts for a month or two or gets to 50 you know it's they could be out of business easily out of business yeah it's gonna be very hard and, and 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 you can't and you know what's interesting what they haven't said yet is and i don't even know where they're going to get the money what happens when if if uh fogel gets his ppp loan runs his restaurant essentially pays his employees not to work for eight weeks because I can't open my restaurant anyway. All right. of a sudden they tell me June 1st, July, June 15th, right? I'm, I'm on my seventh week <laughs> of my eight weeks of Triple P loan. Hey, Mitch, you can open your restaurant, but you can only do 25% capacity. Then what do I do? I mean, right. everybody, I, I let people go for good. Uh, can I go get another Triple P loan? Where's that money going to come from? So these are all a bunch of these unknowns. I know it's a long-winded answer to the question that the person had, Jim. But I think for restaurants yeah. and hospitality, I think you're in a pretty, pretty tough. And, and Mitch, I, I have this question too, that, that you know, let's say that a, that a current business owner has, a, uh, has an SBA loan and, you know, they've been in business for three or four years and they're struggling to pay that loan and they go to sell. Is it possible to try to work out like a short sale type of a situation on an SBA loan if, if the business is being hurt right now or what, what can be done in that scenario? Um, so... That's a great, it's a great question because I'm sure it's going to come up a heck of a lot. Um, so you didn't ask this, but I'll put it out there because some people may not know this. Uh, in part of the CARES Act, the SBA is going to pay for all existing loans in good standing as of the CARES Act date. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It's a different date, but just for ease. Um, and for all SBA loans that are new and closed between then and I think the 30th of June, the SBA is going to pick up the first or six next months. six months worth of monthly payments. Right. right. I actually have a very good friend of mine up in, um, in Orlando who um, called me about two weeks ago and he was ecstatic because um, he's, he's actually doing okay. I mean, he's not hurting that bad. He's got a business that's a little bit recession proof. And the SBA picked up his uh, monthly nut and it was like 18 grand. And so, you, you know, he did the math. And um, we ended up, uh, and ended up, uh, he's going to get what, $108,000. I closed the loan for a guy who uh, had a very tough time. I didn't close it for him, I closed for the bank, had a very tough time getting an SBA loan. We finally got it closed. His nut was. His nut was 
$50,000 a month. And um, I called his attorney and said, you know what? Your guy went through a lot of pain, but here's the good news. Yeah. Yeah. $300,000 for him because he's going to pick up six months of, of, his, of his payments. Now, um, so, but you're going to have a lot of businesses that if, like your question, Jim, if, he, if they're not in good standing, they don't get that benefit. And then the guy goes to sell the business. He's going to have to go back to the lender. And the right. way it works in the SBA world is if the lender portfolioed the loan, the lender can make a lot of decisions on its own, but they got to be smart decisions. Um, if the lender sold the guarantee in the secondary market, then it's a little bit of a different dynamic because um, that loan has to be bought back by either by, by the bank or, or by the SBA, depending on, on the situation that it's in. If it's in liquidation, even though he owns the business and it's been in default, then the SBA buys it. If not, then the, then the bank buys it back. And that's an oversimplification, but essentially that's what happens. And ultimately, um, if, if it makes sense to, to do a deal, then I think a bank's gonna be willing to do the deal. It's gonna be a little challenging to get their attention today the way you could have gotten their attention a few months ago or even going forward. I would say that you probably have a window now after this next tranche is expired in the next few days for about a month or so. And I'm totally just speculating here because the first loans went out about two weeks ago and you're supposed to spend the money essentially within eight weeks of when you get your first disbursement which is supposed to be within 10 days after you close. So if you run the math in about seven to 10 weeks, the first tranche and the second tranche are gonna run into the forgiveness part of this. And I truly believe that mm -hmm. incredible man and women power resources of the lenders who did this are gonna be focused on all that they need to do on the forgiveness part. And for a person whose loan is in, um, is not in good standing and they have to get their attention for this, I think it's going to be hard, not impossible, but harder to get the attention they need to get the deal done. So your window may be four weeks starting next week. Just yeah. my good information. We've got a, we've got Paul Sestaro. I'm going to put him on. He can ask a question himself directly to you guys. Paul, are you there? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question on, uh, on showing the business. I, uh, I have a buyer that wants to see it. The seller says, that's fine, no problem. And uh, are we going to come coming out with any hold harmless clauses or uh, uh, forms or whatever that we can have? That we were discussing that earlier about the buyer and seller signing that it would be okay, just to keep us really safe from protecting us you yeah. know, from any. Loss. Yeah, I'd like to prepare a form like that, that that says over there that everyone has agreed and that there's an assumption of risk then by the prospect. And there's also one by the owner then, so that there should not be an issue if something does happen when they come in and they view the business. And, and remember too, and, and while we're talking about this, there is nothing that says that you as a broker have to assume risks as well. So if you don't feel comfortable you know, going in person, if you don't feel comfortable over here because there's some physical issues, health issues, you're not required to go out of your way to do that as well. So and you, can, you can also ask them, you can ask them if they have an issue here with their health. You can ask them if there's been a problem over here or that they've been, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things you can ask people where normally you would not really be able to ask a seller anything. You can ask a seller at this right. point in time. Right. Well, right. I'm going to let you know as, as the state president of the BBF, uh, you know, I'm going to bring this to the attention um, of everything we talked about today to um, the state board. And I think a lot of the state board members are on this call today. And, um, you know, I, I, we've got a wonderful state board. So I, I think that the BBF will be addressing um, all the concerns and advice that these three wonderful attorneys have shared with us today. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, I would think so. Because I, I, I'm, I'm, I work at uh, Cordwell Banker Commercial. And already we have, mm -hmm. do have commercial forms already that right. we can. So that's what I was looking forward to today, you know, just for our protection on what to do. 
Now, right. also, can I have them go on their own? Would I be protected if they went on their own, the buyer, if I said the buyer and seller? I'm not crazy about that, but uh, if they have no problem with that and I didn't show up, or would I still be responsible? Jim, I think you just answered that question before, so I was going to leave that for you. Okay. Uh, what he was asking, yeah, but, would, would he still be responsible? I mean, you know, he doesn't have to. I think you answered it. You don't have to be there. And I think regardless, if you're having a buyer-seller meeting, whether you're there or not, you're still going to need to have, you should have those forms signed that you guys are Right, and, and you can be there virtually as well. You, you certainly can use Zoom. There's other services that can be used. People are showing houses on a regular basis virtually. You can do the same thing over there for the business. Yeah. So people are asking, uh, Mitch, a couple of people are asking about um, uh, the uh, PPP. Yep. Um, okay, and and you know it's they're saying it's not attached to the assets they're not putting a lien against the business how does that get transferred to a buyer if a buyer is buying it i mean my my response to those type of things is always that the u.s government is the most powerful you know entity that's ever existed on the face of the earth they're going to find a way but i want to hear what you would say as an attorney <laughs> so that's probably the best, <laughs> that's probably the best answer um uh, so my so here's litigation 101 light Gil, you can slap me around if I mess this up. But um, so basically, what happens is this: um, first of all, take it, right, take into consideration this is the United States government, and also take into consideration that um, the rules are still evolving relative to this program. Even right. though it looks like this today, it's changing frequently. That's what makes it really hard. Like I have been, I work, I have, I really have never worked as hard in my life and I've worked hard during parts of my life um, over the last 30 years. I have never worked as hard as I did um, up until about last weekend for a month. It was every lender, tons of borrowers that I, I represent 20 to 30 lenders around the country. It was tons of lenders and different people within the lender and tons of borrowers. Mm -hmm and CDCs, which are components uh, that you have in a, a group that you have in a 504 loan program, and USDA guys can do some of that work as well, all asking me a ton of questions, and a lot of the same questions time and time and time and time again. Um, and I, I gotta tell you, I, I read as much as anybody did. I, I believe I'm an expert in this at this point. I've read so much in it. I still don't understand a lot of it. Um, it goes very deep. They change the rules all the time. Uh, um, it's, it's been kind of uh, a strange experience for me uh, trying to, to understand this. The SBA world, if you've been in it at all, is, um, is, uh, changes all the time, it just does. Uh, they change the SOP regularly, and so that requires enough energy to know what's going on. This is a whole new level. So having said that, um, when you have an obligation, if you don't pay the obligation, and presuming you have a note back to the earlier part of our show, um, then you end up um, having um, a lawsuit that can occur against you. If you get a lawsuit, then they can take the lawsuit and they can make a lien out of the lawsuit on the asset. Right. So that's in, in 50 words or less, how a debt which isn't originally secured by a lien on the assets of the company can through a default and a lawsuit, and then a lien from the lawsuit judgment become a, a, um, a, a, an encumbrance on the personal property of a business. That's the first thing. The second part of this is, and this is real important. I actually have a, my, a firm newsletter going out today and I cover some of this in the newsletter. Um, the, the act is very specific as to what the funds can be used for. Right. If you do not use the funds for those purposes, then you have personal liability and you have, and you always have the corporate liability. So in a stock purchase, if it's misused, the guy that signed the promissory you note, know, if there is one in the application can have some personal liability. He owns the stock, bam, now you got an issue. Okay. Alternatively, if the company didn't do it, then it also can uh, become an issue for the company and you bought the liability and even if that doesn't ultimately hold you liable, why in the world 
would you ever want to have a situation when you're buying a brand new business that the first call after you called your sister, brother, mother, son, kid, whatever, to tell them how excited you are you bought the business was to your lawyer because you have a problem and the lawyer needs a retainer because they have to defend you because yeah. your, your world is getting audited or there's a lawsuit that's been filed or the eyes of the government now are upon you. So the practicalities of there not being a UCC lien are, are, um, are, aren't as pretty in some cases as they may appear to be. Does that answer the question? I think, I think it does. I think it does. Do my hey, fellow lawyers yeah, nod I, your head? Yeah, and, and, I'm, and I think too, Mitch, when you start looking about keeping employees, you know, when you buy a business, it's very difficult. A lot of those employees are gonna leave. And that's one of the PPP, you know, components is that you right. have to have the employees there for eight weeks. I've seen businesses where after a couple of weeks, the owner comes in, the, uh, the new owner comes in, he can't make the same transition. He starts putting on new rules for says, by the way, those bonuses are gone from you now. And at that point in time, everybody leaves. That's a very, very, very point. The only way, again, in a nutshell, if you don't know the triple P program, you got to use 75% of the money you got. Right. For right. Payroll. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it could be people that, you know, you, and there is a uh, safe harbor that if people were fired, you can hire people back. You can hire other people in to fill those roles, but that's what it's supposed to be used for. Right. Um, and, and, here, and, and look, also being practical for a second, there's just gobs of these loans, right? Just so many. And the, and the SEC, not the SEC, the Treasury and SBA don't really have, at least today, the manpower to be able to do the investigations and the audits that they probably should do in some cases. Um, but that I think will change. Uh, there's a huge portion, I don't remember what the right. dollars were, that were in the CARES Act that were allocated for enforcement and for um, the OIG, which is the Office of the Inspector General, uh, Treasury, to look at these things. And in fact, I believe that Mnuchin and a couple others came out and said, we will be looking at these closely. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, and, and then also you've all read the papers and seen you know, the optics of all the, the restaurants and the hotels and the mm -hmm. LA Lakers and a bunch of others that got these loans. You had to get back. Necessarily lead the need. Yeah, they, were they allowed, here's the crazy thing. Were they allowed to get the loans? Absolutely, they were allowed. The law, four corners of the law and mm -hmm. the way it was, they did what they were supposed to do except one thing. There's a little sentence in there that says, you have to believe that the circumstances that you're in will, will lead to a need for these funds. Right. That's very gray, right? Also, so the LA Lakers really have a, a need for these funds? It was a public relations disaster for these companies, too. It, it was a public relations disaster. Oh, it was, it was a huge PR disaster. Yeah. So what yeah. did they do? A lot of them gave it back. But, but, right. but in fairness, by the way, I've got, I've got among the people that were calling me, I must have had five, six PE firms private equity firms call me saying, how do I get these funds? I mean, I, I'm two levels down from big private equity out of Manhattan that created a you know, subsidiary that's wholly owned that bought my company two years ago. I am 80% down, I'm gonna be 90% down, they shut me down and I say to them, right. what did you do? And I said, well, you know, we went to the holding company right above me and I said, okay, what did they tell you? And they said, well, go to the PE firm. So I did, they went to the PE firm. No, I didn't, but they did. What did the PE firm said? The PE firm told the guy on level three, go get a triple P loan. Right. So right. the guy from level three is like, what do I do now? I don't qualify. And, and so I've lost 200 employees. Boom, gone. Yeah. And no solution. Hey, hey that, that's great. You know, I, I hate to interrupt. Um, we've gone way past our time. And I got to say, Gil, Mitch, Deborah. This is one of the best webinars we've had. The amount of information that you've given us is incredible. I think what we're going to need to do in the future, if it's okay, maybe do this again and break it up more into smaller segments so that we can get more in depth about things. And also, this is the kind of stuff that's constantly changing as well. So, you yeah. know, as you guys mm -hmm. learn more information or as, as the laws become more clear, um, that would, you know, I think it'd be great if you guys would be willing to come back. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that'd be terrific. How can the attendees get a hold of you? I mean, website, email, phone number, Gil, how would you want somebody to get a hold of you if, if you if they wanted to get a hold of you, Gil? 
Sure. So uh, blackrocklaw.com. Uh, that's blackrocklaw.com. Go directly to my website or on Facebook. They can type in my name, Gil Sanchez, Tampa, or blackrocklaw.com on Facebook and all my information's there. Fantastic, Gil. Mitch, how about you? Um, yeah, mine, um, I have my website is, uh, I would encourage anybody to look at my website. In fact, the article that I'm sending out today uh, will be very helpful. So, and I'm gonna post stuff to the website periodically on this. Um, so if you go to uh, Fogel, F-O-G-E-L, law group, dot com www.fogelawgroup.com um it'll be there it may be under newsletters it may be under uh, hot topics um, and then if you ultimately uh, need to reach me the telephone number is on there that's the best thing to do for stuff okay great right. yeah, thank you very much mitch deborah jim thank you i would do d carmen and that's c-a-r-m-a-n at carmenlegal.com and again that's c-a-r-m-a-n um, and I'm going to give everybody my cell number because if, if you have any questions, that's the best, easiest way to get a hold of me. It's 954-415-1968. Great. Thank you so much. Well, I want to yeah. let all the attendees know that um, we are going to be putting this on YouTube. I'm going to be putting it on a different YouTube channel um, on the BBF because we've got, like I said, nearly 100 people that were not, um, not business brokers in the state of Florida. On, on, in attendance tonight. So I, I wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to review this. I also wanna say next Thursday, two o'clock, we're gonna be doing another webinar, and this is gonna be a really important one too. Darren Mize, the gentleman that started Peer Comps, um, is gonna be joining us, and he's gonna be talking to us about how to evaluate a company right now, and what are we gonna do? So I think that's something that we've all been asking and questioning as business brokers. So I think that's gonna be another really important webinar. Gil, Mitch, Deborah, I, I can't tell you enough. Thank you so much for taking so much time today to tell us everything that you've told us. I mean, it's just a wealth of information. I knew our heads were going to be spinning. I just didn't know it was going to be spinning this much. <laughs> well, Jim, we wanted to thank you too, because I know how hard and how much effort you put into the BBF and uh, you put some terrific programs together. So thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Jim. Did an excellent yeah. job. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be a help, everybody. Good luck out there. Be safe. Stay yes, well. Be yeah, be stay, safe. stay safe and healthy, everybody. And be hopeful and spread, spread the hope. Spread the hope. Sell right. another business today. Come on. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye, Bye guys. Take Bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye.